trip. But Rabbi Tzvi Sittner, in addition to being the rabbi of the Village Shul in Toronto, is also, is also a partner of Project Inspire in so many different projects and programs, not to mention this weekend and the three-day trips. But somebody who came as a lecturer on a three-day trip and said, we have to bring the whole city of Toronto on these trips. Everyone needs to be on these trips. Went back, and he has a massive group just from Toronto. Um, Torontonians in New York don't get along so well, so we're just doing it only for Toronto people. Uh, in fact, when I was growing up, they used to tell a joke. I don't know if it's still relevant today, but they said, how many Torontonians does it take to change a light bulb? A hundred. One to change the light bulb and 99 to find out how they do it in New York. No? I, was, uh, I don't know if it's still relevant today, but really, Rabbi Tzvi Sittner has, like I said, not only come as a lecturer, not only come to join the weekends, but has come as a full partner in everything that we do. He started this weekend off with the spirit and the focus that we needed for this weekend, and he will end it. So without further ado, Rabbi Tzvi Sittner. Many of us have, ha have the uh, window into the uh, Shabbos project, the Shabbatones that Project Inspire does. But show of hands, how many people have been on a three-day trip? Amazing. Okay, that makes me so happy to see and to hear. Um, <clears throat> first, I want to give a shout-out, Malki Stoller. Thank you for... She, gave me, she, you know, she told me last night I better stay. I mean, I was doing it anyway, but thank you for encouraging me to be here this morning, Malki. Um, three-day trips. Baruch Hashem, they're incredibly inspiring. And uh, I've been on, I think, maybe four of them already. I've also been on several Project Inspire Israel trips. For those of you that have not been on the Israel trips, uh, we've got to get them going again, but they were very, very inspiring trips. I want to tell you about one particular trip that I was on. And for those of you that have been on the three-day trips, you've heard this before, but I can't say it enough, and, and you can't hear it enough. And if you can hear it enough, too bad, because I'm saying it anyway. So there was one particular trip that I was on. It was an Israel trip, and we had people from all over the world. And on these trips, you know, one of the things that they always like to do is to kind of get everybody together. One of the ways they do that, of course, is vulnerability, getting people to share, getting people to support each other and listen. And when you do that, it really brings people together on the bus. So, you know, when you get to a, you're on one of these buses and you've got people from all over the world on one bus, like, well, we got to break down all the walls as quick as possible because this, this, uh, trip is a short trip. So I get up on the bus and I, I do this as I often do on every trip. Get up on the bus and I'll say, um, guys, all of you took off time. You left your work, you left your office, you left your families. You came here all the way to Israel for this week. And I want to know why. And I'll ask everybody to get up on the mic and to share. And one by one on every single trip, guys will get up on the mic and they'll begin to share. Hey, my name is so-and-so. I'm from this and this place. I'm here because of this. And it gets pretty emotional and people are very open. There's a lot of sharing going on. It's kind of like an AA meeting, but with alcohol on a bus. That was, that's... <laughs> and, and everybody begins to share. It's very, very meaningful. Anyways, so I get up on this one trip. I get up on the mic and I say, guys, we're here. I'm looking around the bus. It's a full bus. I said, we are, um, we're, we're brothers. And I want to get you guys up on this mic one by one. Come up here. Tell us who you are. Open your hearts. Open your minds. Share with us. And for the first time ever, nobody, like, got up. So I made another. I said, come on, guys, let's go. Who's going to be the first courageous one to get up on the mic? Come on up. Tell us who you are. Share with us. Silence. I'm like, what is going on? And then I realized I was on the Spanish-speaking bus. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, here we are. We're driving from, like, Sfas down to Ushalayim. I've got a three-hour bus ride. I've got my group of Torontonians and a whole bunch of Spanish speakers. And I'm like, oh, gosh. Like, how are we going to get the sharing going exactly on this bus? This is going to be problematic. I call out one guy. I said, what's your name? He spoke a little bit of English. He says, Pablo. I said, Pablo, stand up for a second. Guy stands up. He's like 6'5", right? I'm like 4'2". He's Sephardi. I'm Ashkenazi. He eats burritos. I have gefilte fish. We're like, we're like, there's like nothing. We, you know, he speaks Spanish. I speak English. We have nothing in common, the two of us, okay? I said to him, I said, Pablo, where's, where's your grandmother from? He says, Poland. I said, mine too. I said, where in Poland? He says, Ludge. I said, mine too. I said to him, you know, that means that our grandmothers could have been neighbors, speaking Yiddish together, cooking gefilte fish. And really the only difference between you and me 
is what boat our grandmothers got on. Really, we're the same. Yours got you to Mexico, mine got me to New York. That's it. Shortly after I said that, guys started getting up on the mic. It's a three-hour trip from, Ushalayim, from, from Tzfas down to Yushalayim. And I'm, I'll never forget this scene where I see some guy getting up. He's speaking in Spanish. And he's crying and crying. And I'm looking at my guys from Toronto. They don't understand a word he's saying. But they were crying along with him. As he poured out his heart, they were feeling what he was saying. A couple days later, it's Friday night, we have this beautiful meal at Aish in Jerusalem, and then we walk over to, uh, to Mea Sha'arim, ultra-Orthodox community. I tell the guys, we're gonna go, I'm gonna take you to a Hasidic dish. Many of you guys have been there. I take, we, we go to Mea Sha'arim. We're walking down these dark alleys, 11, 12 o'clock at night on a Friday night. And as we're walking with this group, I hear singing coming from one of the uh, apartments. I said to the guys, I said, did you hear that? They said, yeah. I said, that's what happens on a Jewish home on a Friday night. We sing Shabbat songs. I said, I want to tell you something else. I bet, although this is an ultra-Orthodox community, I bet if we were to go in there and knock on that door, I bet you he would invite us in. So the Torontonians were like, no, no, we never do that. And like the, the Spanish guys were like, do it, do it, do it. <laughs> so I'm like, you know what, fine. I'm up for a challenge. I walk up to this, choose, I walk up to, the, to this apartment in Yushalayim, in Meisharim, dark Friday night, 11.30 at night, and I knock on the door. This Hasidish boy answers the door, long payas, he looks at me, said, Shalom, Shabbat Shalom, Ani Rav, Ani Poem, Kvutsa, Anashim, Mechutz Laretz, right? I'm here with a group from, from uh, you know, outside of Israel, and it's a mixed group of people. I begin to tell him, I said, and uh, we heard the singing, and we want to know if we can come in. And he closes the door. <laughs> and I look over to my guys, I'm like, <laughs> and about a minute later, the door opens up and he says to me, he says, the Tata says you can come in. So I turned to the guys, I didn't tell them how many we had, I turned to the guys, all right, boys, let's go. <laughs> all of a sudden, 25 guys come into this apartment. <laughs> and uh, my jaw almost dro j dropped. Like my, I felt like my face was going to fall off when I looked at the head of the table when we came in. Sitting at the head of the table is a man with a long white beard and a long white payas and a long gold coat and a big furry strimal. We had walked into the apartment of the Dayan of Toldos Aaron, like the second in command, like the queen bee, the head rebbe. That's whose house we walked into, okay? And I'm like, find me a hole to crawl into. It was like so uncomfortable. And they quickly started pulling chairs and like we, you know, we all, and he was sitting around the table with all of his, his, his Talmidim, his students, his children, his son-in-laws, all the, everybody's together. And, they, and, and all the, the men and women, they start grabbing chairs from us. We all crowd around. And we sit there and it's really like pretty intense. And he's at the head of the table and we're all looking at him. And he says, so where are you guys from? <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? <laughs> that was probably the first English he spoke in like 70 years. He left Australia like, seven, like 60 years ago. He had left Australia, came to Meishar and became this big Hasidic Rebbe. Anyway, he says, okay, you want me to sing? You want us to sing? We'll sing. And all the Hasidim together begin to sing. I believe in Mashiach. And they keep singing it. And they sing again and again and again. And we're all watching as they're swaying. Everyone has their eyes closed. We're taking this in. It comes to an end. And uh, he, uh, he says, do you guys want to come for lunch tomorrow? We say, no, thank you. We appreciate it. We, they escort us out. We go back on the street of Mea Sharim. It's dark, we're standing out in the street. I said to the guys, do you realize what just happened? And they were like, no. <laughs> I said, okay. It's normal to sing on a Friday night. We sing certain Shabbat songs. It's not normal to sing that. They said, why, what was that? I said, that tune 
goes back to the Holocaust. The story behind that tune is that there was a certain Hasidic cantor, a Mazritzer Hasid, named Rabbi Azriel David Fastag. And unfortunately, when, he was, when, when his whole community, his shtetl was rounded up and taken into these cattle cars on the way to Treblinka, he was a famous cantor and he began to compose that tune as the sounds of the wheels on the tracks making their way in, 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 in synchrony all the way to, to Treblinka. He's listening to the sound and he begins to compose this tune in the cattle car. And he begins to sing. And the story goes that everybody in the, in the cattle car together started singing with him. And all the Jews squished into this cattle car on the way to Treblinka. And they all sang and sang and sang. And they repeated it and repeated it. And eventually he said, whoever gets this tune, somehow if you survive, whoever gets this tune to the Majitzer Rebbe in New York, he says, I'll give you half of my heavenly word, half my olam haba. There were two boys, two young boys that found like a, a crack in, 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 the top of the, in the top of the cattle car and they squeezed through and they jumped from the train. One of them died on the jump. The other one survived and he got the tune to the Masjid Rebbe. They said that that year, the Rebbe sang that tune on Yom Kippur in Shul. And he said, to that tune, they went to the gas chambers. And to that tune, we will greet Mashiach. And so I turned to the guy standing there in Meir Sharim, in this dark night, and I said, I don't know, but maybe, although it is normal to sing on a Friday night, maybe he chose that tune. Because his message to all of us sitting around that table was, look, although I'm from Australia, but I'm Yerila, a Yerushalmi Hasidic Jew, living in Yerushalayim. You guys from Toronto, all different backgrounds, Reform, Conservative, a group from Mexico, Sephardic group. But we all come back to one point. And he just brought us back to the Holocaust with that tune. Same people, different boats. In fact, the Klosenberger Rebbe, who unfortunately lost his wife and 10 children in the Holocaust, Klosenberger Rebbe said, there's one thing that I actually miss about the Holocaust. Something I miss about the Holocaust. He said, when we were on these death marches, he said, my hair was shaven, my beard was shaven. We all wore the same black and white striped uniform. And nobody knew who anybody else was. You didn't know if the person next to you was Hasidic or Litvik, Litva, Lit, uh, Litvak. You didn't know if the person next to you was religious or not. We just stood arm in arm to keep warm and to keep each other warm. He said, that's what I miss about the Holocaust. Really, we're all the same. We're all the same. One family, brothers and sisters, different boats. You know, we never know why God does what he does. But I think at the same time, while we have no idea why things are happening in Israel the way they are, we also can't ignore the fact that the greatest pain that we've seen in our lifetimes to the Jewish people happened at the same time as the greatest divide that we've seen in the Jewish people in our lifetimes. We don't know why God does what he does, but we can't ignore the fact that they happen at the same time. In fact, it actually bothered me a lot. I'm sure many of you have seen the burning of Israeli flags all around the world. I saw one that really like opened my eyes. Just 10 days ago, they were burning Israeli flags in Iran. 
now you say, okay, that makes sense. But where in Iran were they burning the Israeli flags? At the tomb of Mordechai and Esther. Incredible. 2,500 years later. Here we are. We think, you know, it's us and Hamas. It's us and Iran. Right? That's what it is. It's not a new war. This war has been going on for thousands and thousands of years. Different names, different people, different enemies. And if we go back 2,500 years, incredible to see. Here they are burning our modern-day Israeli flag at the tomb of Mordechai and Esther. You have Hamas burning Israeli flags at the same spot where the Hamas of the day, Haman, was doing what he was doing to us. And how did it start back then? How was it, how could it be that if we have a people that we're all just brothers, we're all one family, how do we get to where we are today? Go back to that war where Haman tried to destroy us. And it answers the question of what's happening to us today. Because Haman, the Hamas of the day, turns to Ahasuerus and he says, Yesh no am echad mefuzer or mefurad. He says, there's one nation that's spread out. Now this is his pitch to, hum, to, to Ahasuerus to destroy us. He's making a pitch. We have to destroy the Jewish people. And what's his pitch? There's Am Echad, there's one nation that's spread out. So what? What he was saying was, Yesh no Am Echad. There's a nation that's Echad. There's a nation that's one and only one, whose power comes from their oneness. There's a nation that's, that's impenetrable, that is so powerful. When they're, when they're echad, and I'm echad, we are one, and so powerful when we're one. But right now, Ahasuerus, they're mefuzer u mefura bena amim. Right now, they're spread out, they're divided, there's divisiveness, they're arguing, they're cutting themselves up, they're fighting among themselves. And so now's the time to destroy them. The history of the Jewish people shows us that when we're divided, we are susceptible to the greatest anti-Semitism. You know, many of us uh, at the pace of Seder, we'll lift up our cups, we all sing, right? Vehi she'amda, vehi she'amda, right? Everybody sings that? Not just me? You're staring at me like I'm... Okay, great. Right? Just me? Okay, thanks. <clears throat> thanks, brother. Right? We lift our cup, and it's actually a funny thing to sing, if you look at the words, but Not only one nation destroyed us, Every generation, they stand up to destroy us, and we're like singing it. It's like, it's like hey, imagine like, you know, and every generation, they try to kill us, right? It's actually a little bit weird, but... But the Svas Emes has such a beautiful explanation. He says... When we say shelo echad bilvad, it means not only one, shelo echad, not only one nation tried to destroy us, ela bechol dor vador, every generation they try to destroy us. Shelo echad can be understood as not only one nation tried to destroy us, or shelo echad, when we're not one, bilvad, that alone, amad aleinu lechaloseinu, is when they stand up to destroy us every generation. We see this time and time again. When we're united, we're powerful. When we're divided, we're attacked. Yeah, we're all the same. We're brothers and sisters. So how do we end up where we are now, right now in the world? Again, I'm not a prophet, and I'm not saying this is why God does things. But all I can tell you is, that when we're divided historically, we're attacked. And boy, were we divided a month ago. And boy, were we attacked. So what unites us? What brings us together that makes us that impenetrable, all-powerful nation? How can we come together once again? I think there's two things that bring the Jewish people together. One of them is something that we're seeing now. You know, about, uh, I think it was, uh, I don't know, last May. Last May I was asked to speak uh, in, the, in Toronto at this event, this unity event. It was when there was uh, some attacks happening in Israel, uh, some rockets, and I was speaking at this unity event. They, had, they brought together every fifth grade class from every single Jewish school across the city. So you had like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids all together. 
talk about unity. And I said to them, you know, I saw this video. It was a video of a bus stop in Beit Shemesh. The bus stop, it was a Friday afternoon. Some of you may remember this, it was May 12th. Friday afternoon, at the bus stop you see different groups of kids, different ages, different types, black and white, some colorful shirts, whatever, all different, different ages, different types. Some maybe more academic, some maybe more cool and sporty, whatever. All spread out. Some standing on one side of the bus, some inside, some outside. Suddenly you hear this red alert, right? that, that sound that none of us want to hear. And the kids realized what they weren't expecting. It wasn't like now. The kids realized there's a rocket that's about to hit any second. And you watch this video. You can probably find out. You watch this video. And you see the kids, and they're all scrambling. And they start running around the, the bus stop. But there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to, there was nowhere to hide. So they, they, they were trying. And then all of a sudden, you see they all go into the bus stop together. All of them under this one bus stop. They squish in. And then you hear, boom. Thank God nobody was injured. But I said to the boys, look at this. Before that alarm went on, you had all these Jews, all these different kids, different types. I'm going to stand with my friends because I'm that type. You stand with your friends because you're that type. Also, the older kids, the younger kids, we don't really talk to you. We don't hang out with each other. We're just very different. We're all different. You know, you're, not my, you're not really my type. And suddenly, all the types and all the clothing and all the labels and all the ages and all the stages and all the religious things disappear when we hear that siren. And suddenly, they're all together, arm in arm. Because one of the things that brings the Jewish people together is when we're scared. I was telling my kids a story the other night. I was telling them a story, and they, 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 every night I try to tell them bedtime stories, and they say, Tati, could you record it? Could you, could, you, could you record it? Make it a scary story. I said, okay, fine, I'll make it a scary story. So I start telling them a scary story, and as I'm going through the story, and I'm building it up, and it's getting more and more intense, and the kids are like listening, and it's getting to that point, that you know, climactic point in the scary story, and then all of a sudden, I said, boom, and you see the two of them, my kids jump, and they grab each other, and they grab onto me. <laughs> And like, I, I just had that reminder of what it means when we're scared. When we're scared, we grab each other, we grab our father. That's what they did. They grabbed each other, they grabbed me. When the Jewish people are scared, we grab each other, we grab our father. One of the things that brings us together and brings us back to our Judaism is anti-Semitism. It's when we're really scared. Right now you look around the world, I don't know about you, turned on my phone after Shabbos last night, looked at the different rallies around the world, seeing tens of thousands of people screaming, wanting to see Israel wiped off the face of the earth, intifada, intifada. To me that brings fear. And that fear makes us come together, makes us come back to Hashem. And I look back at my notes from what I said to these boys last May. And at the end of what I wrote to them last May was, Guys, what message are we sending to Hashem if the only way that we're going to come together is if you send us rockets? The message we're sending is, Hashem, you want us to unite? You want us to drop our differences and come together? You got to send us a lot of rockets. Give us something really bad. And so I said to the boys, we don't want that. We don't want that. And although that is one way that brings the Jewish people together, it doesn't have to be the only way. You see, every single Rosh Chodesh, we say, Misha Asa Nisim Lavosenu, the one who did miracles for our forefathers, the Goal Osam Me'avdos Lecheros, and who redeemed them from slavery to freedom, we say, who yigal osanu bekarov? May Hashem, who redeemed our forefathers from slavery to freedom, may He do it for us too, bekarov, very soon. May He end all this, this pain and suffering. May He end the chamasas of the world and bring us to freedom together. May our bakanfas ours from all the four corners of the, of the world. And how is that going to happen? Chaveirim kol Yisrael, venomar amen. That's how it ends. 
Hashem. We want to see this redemption. We want to come to get, we, we want to see this end and we want to see that the slavery and the pain and suffering of the Jewish people are finally going to disappear. May it be soon. May you do it. And how's it going to happen? Chaveirim kol Yisrael, when all Jews are friends. That sounds nice. But practically, all Jews are friends. You know, it sounds like a kumbaya, you know, kind of like, uh, let's all just be friends. Let's be friends, right? Come on. What does that mean? Chaverim kol Yisrael, when the Jewish people all become friends together, then we're going to see that redemption from slavery to freedom. You know, I was thinking, the word chaver, friend, the word is chibor. That's the word is. It means connection. How do you bring two things together? How do you make two things connected? I don't know a lot about construction, but I do know that when I see someone laying bricks, they have all these bricks, each of the bricks are pretty similar, they're not exactly the same, but each of the bricks are pretty similar, and you want to connect them one to the other, you put cement, you put some type of glue, something to bond the pieces. They're already pretty similar. But you want to bond them together. So use some cement. Are we all going to be friends? No. But we can all be bonded together in some way by finding the glue that attaches, that makes a chibor, that makes chaver, that makes one connected to the other. And if you think about it, looking around this, this room, are we all friends? I mean, hopefully we are. But one thing's for sure, whether we're friends or not, in the sense of the English word, we're connected. Because what we've been talking about and doing this whole weekend, it's all been around the glue that connects us, around our Torah, our Shabbos, the Shabbos project. We find things that glue us, that bond us together. Around the world today, you see people of every background coming together, finding ways to bond. What are they bonding over? Chesed, tzedakah, volunteering, doing some act of kindness. Because even if we're not exactly the same, but we're similar enough, we can work together. We can find ways to bond. Things that bring us and connect us one to the other. This is something that we all have in this room and that really what practically inspire and, and what we've been doing here over the Shabbos is. Each of us has a little something to share, something to give. And each one of us is trying to share it with the next person. It's that glue. I heard this amazing story. I read it, and it was an article written by Howard Schultz, who's the former CEO of Starbucks. And he writes, I'm going to read it to you because I can't say it better. He says, when I was in Israel, I went to Mea Sharim, the ultra-Orthodox area within Jerusalem. It was along with a group of businessmen that I was with. I had the opportunity to have an audience with Rabbi Nussan Svi Finkel, the head of the yeshiva there. Finally, the doors opened. What we didn't know was that Rabbi Finkel was severely afflicted with Parkinson's disease. He sat down at the head of the table, and naturally our inclination was to look away. We didn't want to embarrass him. We were all looking away, and we heard this big bang on the table. Boom! Gentlemen, look at me, and look at me right now. Now his speech affliction was worse than his physical shaking. It was actually hard to listen to him and to watch him. He said, I only have a few minutes for you because I know you're all busy American businessmen. Just a little dig he was giving us. Then he asked, who can tell me what the lesson of the Holocaust is? He called on one guy who didn't know what to do. It was like being called on in the fifth grade without, even, without having the answer. The guy said something like, uh, we will never forget, never forget. The rabbi completely dismissed him. I felt terrible for the guy until I realized that the rabbi was getting ready to call on someone else. All of us were sort of under the table looking away, you know, please, not me. He didn't call on me. I was sweating. He called on another guy who had such a fantastic answer. We will never, ever again be a victim or bystander. The rabbi said, you guys just don't get it. He said, gentlemen, let me tell you the essence of the human spirit. As you know, during the Holocaust, the people were transported in the worst possible inhumane way by rail car. They thought they were going to, going to a work camp. We all know they were going to a death camp. After hours and hours in this inhumane uh, corral with no light, no bathroom, cold, they arrived at the camps. The doors swung wide open 
and they were blinded by the light. Men were separated from women, mothers from daughters, fathers from sons. They went off to the bunkers to sleep. As they went into the area to sleep, only one person was given a blanket for every six. The person who received the blanket when he went to bed had to decide, am I going to push the blanket to the five other people who didn't get, it, who didn't get one, or am I going to pull it towards myself to stay warm? And Rabbi Finkel says, it was during this defining moment that we learned the power of the human spirit. Because we pushed the blanket to five others. And with that, he stood up and said, take your blanket, take it back to America, and push it to five other people. One of the things that bonds the Jewish people is when we share with one another. We have, we have a little bit of Torah. As Rav Noach Weinberg always used to say, if you know the Aleph, teach the Aleph. Around this Shabbos, we all came together, different backgrounds, different types. But we all want to share with one another. I want to share my Torah with you. I want to share a story with you. I want to share my inspiration with you. I want to share how much I've grown with you. We, each of us, inspiring each other from every background. When we find things that bond us, like bricks, we're all pretty similar, just different boats. But the glue that connects us, the Torah, the chesed, the inspiration, the kindness, that's one thing that can bring the Jewish people together. But you know, there's another way, and as I said, I don't know a lot about construction, but I see another way that you can take two separate things and bring them together. You see, some things you use cement or glue, you can bond them, but then there are other things that kind of click together, like a puzzle. You don't need glue. And perhaps you can look at all of us, maybe not in this room, but think about some other people who are not in this room. And imagine we're like puzzle pieces. You know, when you first look, like, look at a puzzle piece, you go, you see two pieces. One has got holes like this, and then it's got other parts that are sort of, uh, you, know, uh, coming, you know, converging out, and some parts that are going in, and concaves. And, and you look at these two pieces, you go, I, I don't see how these are going to come together. I mean, they're just so different looking. And I think there's a lot of that in the Jewish people. Where we go, I'm a piece, you're a piece. We're not similar enough like bricks that you can just lay some glue and connect us. And from far, you look at the two of us, you go, I, honestly, I just don't see the two of us ever coming together. I don't see ever this chibor, this connection. And I think we all have people in our life like that. We're just so different. The interesting thing is that when you do put them together, although from far it looks like I don't see how these are going to come together, they actually click like puzzle pieces and they come together. It's not natural for us. Unlike bricks that all look the same, and say, oh yeah, this is perfect, just a little bit of glue and that's it. Find the things that, that connect us. Puzzle pieces, things that click together. You look at them, you go, they click together, but they're so different. Yeah, but that's what makes them click together. Sure, it takes a little bit of uh, courage. It takes a little bit of effort. But you'll see. They make up for each other's chesronas, for each other's lackings. We can help each other in ways that each of us need. I have to share a story with you. This was a huge eye-opener for me, huge. You know, during COVID, yes, I said the C word, during COVID, trying to run a shul, a center in a community, which is a shared space for everybody, is very complicated. Some people are pro-masks, some people are anti-masks, some people are pro-vaccines, some are anti-vaccine, and, and everyone's entitled to their opinions, but it's a shared space, which means there needs to be something in this shared space that we all agree on, whether we like it or not. So a shul, community center like we have, very hard to run it. And we had to make some decisions that were just gonna work for most people, but some people it won't work for. And I had some people who were so angry. They said to me uh, at the time, they were fur furious with the rules that we had to make that everyone just needs to abide by in this space. So much so that they left and they said, I'm never coming back to this place. And I would see them on the street, I would see them on the street, and for five, for, uh, four years, three years, whatever it's been, every time I see them, they look at me, turn ahead, I say hello, they'll ignore me. Really good people, like really good people. 
But like puzzle pieces, when it came to COVID, we were just not aligned. One of these guys, particular person, we'll call him David, because that was his name. And <laughs> we'll call him David. He's a really, really good guy. I see him all the time, and he wouldn't talk to me. And I remember on Simcha's Torah night, that harrowing day of October 7th, he showed up to Shul. And, you know, I kind of tried to say hi and nothing to talk about. There was a lot of opinions that night on what should happen. Should we dance? Should we cancel Simchas Torah? And every single opinion in between. We started off Simchas Torah night saying, no, we're going to dance, we're going to dance, we're going to fight back by dancing. And we started to dance, but it didn't really you know, feel so right. In fact, one guy said to me, he goes, Rabbi, I just don't like this. It just does not feel right. And he left. He left and he went upstairs. We changed from singing and dancing to some really serious arm-in-arm -arm singing of Achenu together. As soon as we started that very serious, heartfelt, everybody closed their eyes. Achenu kol beis Yisrael. And everybody's singing. I ran upstairs like, I got to catch the guy who left. And I ran upstairs, and I see him. He was on his way out, the guy who was not happy with the, the way the dancing was. And I just, I didn't, say, I didn't say anything. I just took his hands. I brought him downstairs. I, he, he walked in the room. He saw what was going on. Huge circle on the men's side, huge circle on the women's side. Everybody's arms around each other. And I just made, I broke into the circle. The guy who I had brought down from, uh, from upstairs, he was on my right. I put my arm around him. I didn't even look to who's on my left, but I just put my arm around the other guy. And we all closed our eyes and we began to, we began to sing. And the whole place together was singing. It was getting so emotional, it was so heartfelt. People were crying, we were arm in arm, it was really, really intense. Finally, the singing and everything comes to an end. I take my arm off the guy who I brought from upstairs. And I begin to take my arm off the guy on my left. And as I have my eyes closed and as I take my arm off, I hear a voice, a familiar voice. And it said, who said you can take your arm off me? And I look and it was that guy, David. Who said you can take your arm off me? We're like puzzle pieces. And although sometimes from far we look so different, we're really not that different. We just have to push the pieces together and realize that we really can click. I believe wholeheartedly, I believe wholeheartedly that one of the main reasons, if not the reason, that we're facing the anti-Semitism that we're facing today is because we were so divided. It's not my own idea, you just see it throughout Jewish history. And it's easy for us to say, you know, kumbaya, we'll come together, let's do a little chesed together, we'll pack some duffel bags and send them to Israel, look how we're all good friends, come on. That's not unity. After I had this experience with this guy, I realized, you know what? There are other people who don't talk to me too. And I started to text them and I said, you know, it's been years. But just want to make sure you're okay. And their responses to me were, hey, at a time like this, you know, we should really make amends. Why don't we get together when this is all over? Don't we all have people in our lives who we haven't talked to for years? A brother, a sister, a cousin, a friend, someone we had a falling out with? The Jewish people are bleeding, our hearts are torn open, and everyone's hearts are open right now to mend the deepest wounds. That's our job. Our job right now is not just superficial unity, but deep unity. To come together and to put those pieces together that even look like they don't go together. To really bond. And you'll be shocked to see when the person says, who said you can take your arm off me? Because they want to come together with you. This is what Project Inspire is doing. 
We're bringing all of the Jewish people together. Around the things that are shared, it's our Torah. But that's just the glue. Then there's the puzzle pieces. Where we're really different. Where we've created divides over years. Family, friends, people in the community. Now is the time to reach out. To really pull us together as one. Because when we are one, we are protected. That's our job right now. You know, one of the things that I've said in my community numerous times, I told people, I said, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of soldiers that are right now on the front lines. I said, so many of these soldiers are reserves, which means all year long they're walking around in regular clothing. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're in finance. They're just regular people having regular families, regular jobs. But suddenly they pick up a helmet, they pick up a gun, they put on a uniform, and they're dressing differently and they're doing things differently. Every single one of us are soldiers. We're all in the reserves and we're all being called up right now. And even if all year long you don't do certain things, I won't talk to that person. That's fine, but now it's war. And in war we do things differently. We act differently, we dress differently, we do things differently. As reserves we're being called up, we all have to take something on and do things differently. You think it's comfortable for the soldiers to go out to Gaza? Heck no, it's scary. It's scary to take on keeping Shabbos at first. A whole Shabbos, can I do it? Scary to pick up the phone and ask someone forgiveness or try to make amends to someone you haven't talked to in 10 years. Guess what? Soldiers do scary things. That's what makes us great. By doing the things you think you can't and bringing us together. This is our job. Number one, we don't need to be scared into unity because we can do it by finding the glue that connects us, the Torah, the chesed. And like Rav Nassim Svi Finkel said, share it with someone else back in your community. Share what you've learned with someone else. Reach out to someone else, bring them to a Shabbat home, bring them to a three-day trip. Offer to study with them. And like the puzzle pieces, even if it seems like we can't come back together, you'll see, you might look very different, but they want your arm around them. I'm just gonna conclude with one story. The story about this teenage girl in Poland, 1930s. Her name was Marisha Kowalski. Marisha Kowalski, as a teenager, she left home and she began to work uh, for a, a Polish family, a Christian family. And as she worked for them, she, would, she really became part of the family. She fit right in. She would go to church with them every Sunday. She, she, uh, she was really part of the family, part of the community. The one thing this Polish family didn't know about Marisha Kowalski is that she wasn't Marisha Kowalski. She was really Hena Yehudis Grunsty, a Jewish girl who had escaped the ghetto of Lodz. And she blended in with this family and got a job working for them as a nanny. And when the war ended, Hannah Yehudis, her entire family was killed out. She had nobody. She came to America as a young girl and she had a choice. The choice that she had was, look, I have the papers. It says I'm Marisha Kowalski. I know how to talk and act like a Christian woman. I know all the prayers. I can continue to live safely like a Gentile, under the radar. Or I can get rid of this identity and re-embrace my Judaism, go back to being Hena Yehudis Grunstein. It's risky, but she made a choice. And she decided, I'm getting rid of Marisha Kowalski, tore up those papers, and went back to becoming a Jew, brought Shabbos back into her life, brought kosher back into her life. And she became Hannah Yehudis Grunstein. And what I love about this story so much is that I shudder at the thought of what would it have been like if she would have decided to be Marisha Kowalski. I know one thing's for sure. 
I wouldn't be here today because this is my bubby. It's a scary time we're living in. But the choice that we have to make is not to stay safe and hide, but to be proud Jews. To be proud Jews. Because the only reason we sit here today is because at some point in Jewish history, we had parents, grandparents, great-grandparents who faced the same choice. And instead of disappearing, they remained strong. That's why we're here today. My blessing to us all is that we stay strong. We stay united. We reach out to those that's hard for us to reach out to. We bring the Jewish people together so that we have that divine protection. And we stay true and strong to our Judaism so that we together as individuals, as our families, as our communities, as a nation, are strong Jewish people. And that all of the things that have happened in the world and all the pain and suffering only bring us together with each other and with our Father in heaven. Thank you very much. Yeah.